Jim came and spoke to our class one day, and what he said was, when you're a recording engineer, what you're doing is you're capturing air with your microphones, you're turning it into electricity. While it's electricity, you can manipulate it, then you're turning it back into air again. Simple, huh? It sounds kind of overly simplified, but that's what did it for me. That's when I went, oh, that's what we're doing. Okay. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jeff Powell, who got his start as an assistant engineer at Ardent Studios in Memphis, Tennessee, and steadily advanced his career over decades to become a multifaceted gold, platinum, and Grammy-winning record producer, engineer, educator, and vinyl mastering engineer. Jeff also chairs the producer and engineering wing for the Memphis chapter of Naris and is an adjunct professor at the University of Memphis recording program. His career has allowed him to work with many great artists in the studio like Jim Gaines, Glyn Johns, Rob Ferboni, John Hampton, Joe Hardy, and Jim Dickinson, to name a few. And Jeff has even had the honor of recording six albums with the great Tom Dowd. Jeff has worked on multiple gold and platinum records, six Grammy-winning projects, was twice voted Best Engineer for the Premier Players Award by the Memphis Center of Neris was chairman of the producer and engineering wing for the Memphis chapter of Neris for over 10 years and has been honored as a legendary producer of Memphis at the annual Blues Ball. Finally, Jeff learned the art of mastering vinyl and has been cutting records under the name Take Out Vinyl for artists from all over, including the Twilight Singers, Centromatic, Mickey Hart, and Lucero. Jeff has a long career in recording and a list of credits that include Bob Dylan, B.B. King, Tonic, Big Star, The Bottle Rockets, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Sharon Jones, Centromatic, Primal Scream, Lucinda Williams, Ryan Adams, and the Afghan Whigs, to just name many, actually. <laughs> I am extremely honored to be joining Jeff at Sam Phillips Recording Services in Memphis, Tennessee, as part of my Memphis series. Please welcome Jeff Powell to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jeff, are you ready to rock? You bet you. Awesome, dude. Thanks so much for having us here, and it's really a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you as well. Well, so I've done my introduction of you. Can you introduce yourself also in your own words and tell us more about how you got to be here? Sure. Like you said, I've been doing this. I'm a veteran. I've been doing it for about 27 years now, making records. I moved to Memphis to go to the what was then called Memphis State. They had a recording program, and there were very few of those in the country at the time. I believe it was 1987 when I moved here. And so I got into the recording program, really had no experience in the studio whatsoever, but just thought this is what I wanted to do. I had attended the University of Missouri out of high school. And when I said I wanted to be a recording engineer, I was advised to double major in electrical engineering and music, which is none of the, nothing goes together in those two degrees, you know, so I took a lot of hours, but transferred to Memphis State at the time. Now it's called University of Memphis. And they had a really great recording program. So I jumped right in and um, wasn't too long before I got an internship at what was then called Kiva Studios. I remember when I applied for the job, I really toiled over my resume because I really didn't have any studio experience. Tried to make it sound as good as I could. So I stayed up all night working on it. And when I went in for my interview, the owner made a paper airplane out of it and sailed it across the room. So he said, you can start on Monday. So that's how I got started. And, you know, I interned there for about a year. And then an opening came up at Ardent to answer phones and be what they call the night guy to watch the door at night and make coffee, clean the toilets, all that kind of stuff. So Ardent would have been 24-7. They're just going around the clock through the night. Or is it usually? A lot of times it was, yeah. yeah. Depending on who was working, you know. Back in those days, sessions would come in for... It wasn't weird to have a, a band come in for two months to do a record top to bottom. The budgets were huge. The studio rates were way different than they are even these days, you know. But yeah, so I got an opportunity fairly early on. There was Stevie Ray Vaughan had recorded In Step over at Kiva. And I wasn't on the session, but I, Jim Gaines was the producer, and he allowed me to sit in on, on a few 
a few sessions and just be a fly on the wall. And I got to be buddies with their crew, you know, the guitar tech and the amp tech and all that stuff. I knew Stevie a little bit, but not real well, but got to be good, pretty good buddies with the crew guys. And anyway, they were coming into Ardent, you know, whatever it was a couple of years after that to do the Vaughn Brothers record. And whoever was supposed to help load in didn't show up or had something else to do. And Hampton called me and saw that I knew all those guys, you know, and like, hey, Jeff, what have you been doing? You know, so at the end of the night, Hampton asked if I wanted to be the assistant engineer on it. And I I was nervous about it in the sense that there were several people ahead of me in the in the chain, you know. I didn't want to make anybody mad at me. I was like, well, shouldn't you ask so-and-so or so-and-so? They're ahead of me. And he goes, I said, do you want the gig? And so I was, sure. So the first real gig I assisted on at Ardent was the Vaughn Brothers record. And, you know, that went on to win Grammys and a platinum record. So I thought it was just that easy, you know. <laughs> it was a great experience. From there, you know, I stay, I kept working with Hampton a lot and Joe Hardy a lot, kind of became the house assistant and one of the house assistants. So I worked on a lot of records with those guys and eventually started doing jingles myself as an engineer and then engineering more and eventually became a house staff producer engineer. That went on for about, I was an employee there for 10 or 11 years. And then I went independent. I was working all over the place. I still called Ardent my home. I still, till just up to last year, even did most of my mixing there, at least everything I did. Then I came over to Sam Phillips Recording starting last July, and I found my own final record lathe. I've been doing that for about eight years. Larry Nix had trained me on the lathe over at Ardent, and that's a whole nother story. But So I've got a room here now with my lathe in it. I still am recording and producing and I'm going back and forth between the two rooms. Well, so we're not in the lathe room right now, Rockstars. We're actually in the recording space at Sam Phillips Recording yeah, Studio A. Studio A. And uh, it's an amazing, beautiful place. And Matt Ross Bang is also going to tell us a whole bunch about it as well. But describe as if we were in the, the cutting lathe. Tell us what your cutting lathe room looks like. What's well, my, like? my room was uh, originally the control room of what was then Studio B. So it's a fairly small room. It was elevated, as you can see, the for you who can't see at home, the control room's elevated up on stairs, kind of looking through a window down onto the floor. Same design on a much smaller scale in Studio B. So when we started thinking about moving my lathe in there, we tore out that floor and the steps. We didn't realize until we started doing it that it was the steps were solid concrete in there. There's about, you know, five inches of concrete on the floor as well. So it was not an easy task to get to get it all out of there. But so that's the way it's set up now. I took all that stuff out and me and the guy who works with me, uh, Lucas Peterson, helped design the room and we built cabinets and, and stuff to hide the nitrogen and helium tanks and all the materials and all that stuff and just move the computer in and there's a big window still. I'm still it's still a work in progress. I need to still treating the room. Yeah, man, I man, like I never know what to do with my nitrous and helium tanks. <laughs> what what in the world do you need all those for? <laughs> the helium actually goes to cool the stylus while you're cutting. So it, it pumps through a little tiny tube and actually cools the stylus because it can get really, really hot, especially with a lot of high frequency information. The nitrogen is just an inert gas that goes through a hose and I use it to blow off dust and things like that. Right. You so you guys make... don't run a dentist practice on the side? No, I, well, I might not get anything done. If it, if it were nitrous, I don't think I'd get anything done, but it's it's nitrogen. So Nice. Jeff, can you start us off with an inspirational quote for the podcast, something to kind of get us excited about making records? Yeah. I love Mark Twain. I grew up in a small town near where he, near Hannibal, Missouri. One of his favorite quotes of mine that I love is, never allow someone to be your priority while allowing yourself to be their option. And I think that's very poignant in the recording world, especially when you're coming up in the world, you know, you do have jobs that you have to do and work your way up. But to throw all of your eggs in one basket and give your whole self to something, make that your complete priority, someone or some place, and then they don't treat you the same, basically. They treat you as an option or they can cast you away at any time. Just have your priorities straight. You know, it's good to think about it in those terms. Don't let yourself be able to be cast off so easily. Yeah, sure. I mean, almost it almost sounded like the language of some record deals I've heard yeah. in the past. You know? Yeah, same same thing applies for sure. Well, Samuel Clemens was a smart man for sure. I think he used and to funny uh, too. hang out with Tesla just to have fun. Yeah. All right, share with us a story about an important failure for you, you know, something that became a great learning experience through your recording or through your career. Well, it's hard to name... To name just one, I mean, I kind of look at it as a collection or of the small things maybe that can go wrong or that you do wrong. You need to always 
be ready to to learn from it, you know? That's the thing. Don't ever think that you've got it all figured out because there's always, always something to learn. That's whether I'm talking about doing the vinyl or doing recording and producing as well. Yeah, fortunately, right? Otherwise, we'd get bored of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's what keeps it exciting after all these years. Not just the technology, but it's funny with me going the other way, going kind of backwards to learn the vinyl technology. But I started on analog tape, came through the digital tape machine age before Pro Tools. I started on the Diaxis machine, which was a two-track digital editing workstation that we did a lot of crazy stuff with back in the day. Then Pro Tools came about. You know, so I've been through quite a ride as far as the technology goes, but there's been trials and tribulations all the way through. It's coming from that, you know, one of the things that sticks in my mind that's useful information, I think, is when digital tape machines first came out, a lot of the older engineers in general said they didn't like it. It was too harsh or too bright and brittle. But what that stems from after thinking about it and coming up on on analog tape and still using analog tape a lot today, what that really was to me was that when cutting to analog tape, a lot of times the tape, for lack of a better term, can soak it up a little bit, transients and high end and things like that. And letting the tape sit overnight, it'll settle in basically. And I think a lot of the older engineers were used to recording that way. So you like you would brighten things up a little, maybe a little bit more than you would on the way in, and then it would hit the tape and come back the way you wanted it to. With digital, what you put in came out. So if you did any of that brightening or, or had that extra edge to it, it came back the same way you put it in pretty much, and maybe even a little bit harsher depending on the, as the converters improved. That's one of the things I think that caused digital to have a rough rocky road in the beginning, at least. Now mm-hmm. it's way, way better. Yeah, I mean, digital seems like you have to manipulate a lot of things at times with digital, or maybe you have to stop manipulating so many things as, you know, based on your story. That can be a frustrating thing sometimes, you know. It's kind of nice to just have the first the sound you put down be the right sound and not feel like you have to go yeah. change it 10 times. Yeah, and, you know, as I've gotten older too, that's something in general. I used to think as a young engineer that I was supposed to, somehow touch it all the way, you know, when I recorded it, when I mixed it, the whole way. But I rarely, I mean, I don't use a whole lot of EQ when I record anymore. There's, there are times I'm not afraid to use it, but in general, I more look for the right microphone and the right placement and the right instrument, yeah. the right player. Try and all capture those the things. right frequencies to begin with. Exactly. Well, so now share with us an important success story for you, a moment where things really came together well for you. And Well, there's one instance that I can think of that was kind of an aha moment, too, really, at two different times. But as a young engineer, I was engineering, I was assistant engineer on an Eric Gales record. There was a song that they had done several takes on, and they wanted to do take the first half of one take and the second half of another take. It was on you know, two different spots on the tape. So... John Hampton said, you're going to do a tape edit. I'd never done it before. I'd read about it and even seen him do it a few times. I was terrified. And I said, well, what if I mess it up? And he goes, well, then you would not have only ruined one take. You would have ruined two takes um, <laughs> to add a little pressure. So he hung yeah. with me. We asked everybody else to leave the room, you know, and he hung with me, showed me how to mark it, cut it, put it back together. And, you know, you roll it by a few times without playing it, just rewind and fast forward past the heads to pack it in hit play, and man, it went by and it sounded perfect. It was great. And so it was like, then I wanted to, uh, let's edit everything, you know? So that was really a big moment for me to not be afraid of doing something like that and not being afraid. Fear is a really bad thing in the studio. You have to distinguish between respecting the equipment. You don't want to blow things up as well, but you do need to be brave and not be afraid to try anything or just stick to your own way that, well, I know this works, so I'm going to do it this way every time. And five years later, or even less time than that can go by, and you're going to be outdated. And, you know, you just have to be able to do more than one thing. Yeah, you got to try new stuff too, right? And Yeah. And the other aha moment was probably, you know, when I got my, when I cut my first vinyl record by myself, etched my name between the run out groove. And that was a great feeling too. I was ready to jump out of my skin. The first time I ever dropped the cutter head and played on a test cut and played it back, I my knees went weak. It was so beautiful sounding. I'm like, what have, what have we been listening to all these years, you know? <laughs> so I was, I was, I grew up listening to vinyl. That's, that was the main medium back then. So I'd kind of forgotten the sensation, that the way it makes you feel, the way it sounds, the whole aesthetic of touching it, smelling it, you know, it's it's a wonderful thing. Sounds like you gained your virginity back somehow. I did, you know? yeah. Somehow that yeah, Sonically. that's a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty remarkable. So tell us about this process for you of 
learning how to cut records and then transitioning into, well, I don't know if for you it's really a transition or if you just sort of added that to what you do as well. Yeah, well, the way it came about is, uh, you know, the original Stax lathe was over at Arden and it was in Larry Nick's mastering room. Larry and I had been friends for years. The thing had been sitting in there since I started and Larry continued to cut vinyl off and on, you know, up to about a couple of years before I started pestering him to teach me, but it had really been sitting there at that time for a couple of years. It wasn't broken, but those things need a lot of love and attention, you know, so he'd kind of quit using it and wasn't really interested in it. Not too many people were asking for it, you know. So I started basically kind of pestering him about it. I just wanted to, as vinyl became more popular, I was just thinking that I would really like to learn how to do that. He was like, man, I don't want the headache of that again. You know, I master CDs now. What you do is what you do, and it comes back. It's perfect. There's none of this hassle. And I, I kind of kept on him about it until, in a fun way, you know, just kind of teasing him about it. Stuff like, when are you going to teach me, Larry? When are you going to teach me? And one night walking out to, in the parking lot, walking out to his car, I'm like, just think, Larry, if you if you train me, man, you go home every night at 5 o'clock. I could cut at night sometimes and come in and be a check on the turntable for you, renting your machine. And he finally just relented and just turned around and said, all right, man, let's do it. So I kind of just talked him into it. And it was a long process. And John Fry and Chris Jackson did a lot of work to get the machine going again. I kind of sat on the couch and watched and just soaked up everything I could. And then Larry, we just kind of d- jumped in and he slowly let me start doing it myself and to the point where he would go home at night and I would cut vinyl at night and I started building up my own clientele and you know it's it's kind of taken me over I still do produce and engineer records like I was saying but I have as much work as I can handle yeah um talk a little bit about you know that's a cutting lathe that has been at Stax and at Arden I think mm-hmm. and then it's now still here at Sam Phillips recording no it's uh, a different one I bought my oh, own different. Yes. oh mm-hmm. you bought your own okay I found well one, I guess actually. my question is talk a little bit about the meaning of the records that have been cut on a lathe. Is there a long pedigree of There was certainly records? when I was working on the, the Stax lathe. You know, some people freaked out about that. You know, like, wow, my record's being cut on the same lathe as a lot of those. You know, it was there. It was at Stax from 71 to 75, so it was the end years. There were a lot of big records cut on that lathe. And, of course, Larry, when it was at Arden, had cut all the big star stuff. That was always a big draw. ZZ Top records were all cut on that lathe, yeah. you know. It kind of reminds you that, you know, you're using the right tools. So if it doesn't sound right when it gets on the lathe, then maybe it's what you're putting on there. <laughs> yeah. And and Larry told me that early on. That's one of the best pieces of advice he gave me about, about vinyl. He said, look, man, uh, this is different. This machine's going to tell you what to do, not the other way around. And you got to remember, I mean, there's, there's parameters, there's limits to what it can handle. It cannot handle just somebody giving me a CD, a manufactured CD and say, Put that on vinyl. I can't do that as is. You know, I definitely, number one, have to turn the volume way down. It just can't. If I tried to do that, it would just be a, a distorted mess full of overcuts and skips. And, you know, so you have to basically ease it on there. And that's that's where the, the skill of cutting vinyl comes is figuring out how to take what people give you and getting it on the vinyl the best you possibly can with its limitations. Sort of have to unmaster things a little bit sometimes? A little bit, yeah, certainly. I mean, the high end that's put on records and, again, the level and the, and the low end, too, all that stuff has to be tempered to be able to fit. So, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is the first thing I do when I'm supposed to do a vinyl project is I listen to it. You know, I think a lot of people just, when they're mastering, probably just dig in and go, you know. But I actually have to sit there and aesthetically think about it a little bit, make it through the whole record and see what the last song on the side is going to be like compared to the first song on the mm-hmm. side. All that matters. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. I've learned a little bit about that, certainly on the podcast here and, and uh, hearing others speak about it. I mean, there's a, all these considerations about how close the grooves can go together. Exactly. What sort of content you can fit on the end of the record versus on the beginning or the middle. I heard your I heard your podcast with Cameron Henry. It was really good. He was great. He Cameron's was a, a good guy, man. It was a lot of fun to talk about all that stuff and to just stand next to the big cutting lathe, which I think you said you have the same one, right? Is yeah, we right? have the same kind. It's a Neumann VMS seventy. Yeah, it's also equally giant. Yeah, it's it's a big it's a big piece of machinery. It's uh it's an amazing that these things were made in the nineteen seventies and have a nineteen seventies computer in them that they still work. You know. Yeah. I like the 1970s. Uh, Me too. (laughs) You know, I think something that our listeners always want to know is, okay, so I'm 
getting, I'm finishing my mixes now and I'd like to cut vinyl. What advice do you have for people? What's some stuff that people need to know about to make sure that they're, what they deliver to you is as friendly as possible to your process of cutting it onto vinyl? I actually wrote a chapter in a mastering book that came out by uh, Gabri Waddell. I think it's called The Mastering Handbook. I'm not sh- I don't remember the title right off the top. But so even though it's copywritten material, I've asked Gabri if it's cool, if they don't reproduce it. But it saves me a lot of, of time. I usually send that chapter out to them mm-hmm. and, and let them see. You know, it's, it's all about how to pre-master your record for vinyl to get mm-hmm. the best results. Okay. Because there's two different ways of looking at it. You know, what I sell my services to do is to do a direct transfer, you know, to take what you give me and put that on vinyl the best I can. But more and more what's happened is that I do need to do some actual quote-unquote mastering. I am going to need to EQ it a little bit, maybe compress it or peak limit it a little bit, maybe DS it. Sibilance is my enemy, so that's the big thing. Yeah. Did, is sibilance a new thing with the digital age, or did, was it always the enemy of vinyl? Engineers just don't pay attention to it anymore. So that's probably the biggest thing if, for the listeners to know. If you're going to want your record to end up on vinyl, DS your vocals and watch your levels of your hi-hats and your cymbals. Listening to old records, that's why they sounded like they did, you know? People considered it while they were recording. You know, you've heard the old stories of John Lennon used to flash his S's. That means he would run his hand by every time he said an S. Wow. That's the latest rumor has it. And I know some people have done that. We used to do things like put a pencil on the pop filter sometimes if somebody was really essy. And that, um, right in front of the mouth or something yeah, like right that? Yeah, right in front of the diaphragm where we tape it usually to the windscreen. That breaks up S's pretty good too. What an awesome tip. Yeah. I love that. Try that. And Number two pencil. You can also kind of turn off mic slightly, right? Doesn't that help a little exactly, bit? Exactly, exactly. Anything, you know, it's the sound of air rushing between your teeth is what causes that sound, in, at least in the vocals. But it's high frequency information and that's something that it's just too hard for the needle to track, especially as you get closer, as you were saying to the inner grooves of the record, it gets worse as you go toward the middle because the diameter that the needle's tracking isn't as, as long. Yeah. Not, there's not enough helium in the world to, to right. handle it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where do you see vinyl headed? You know, I mean, obviously we've seen a big resurgence of it. Um, what, what are some predictions you have for what's It shows what's no coming? signs of slowing down. It's only getting, there's more and more plants going in, you know, talking about Cameron and over at Welcome to 1979, with Chris Mara, they're just opening a plating facility. That's huge. That's where the biggest bottleneck is, is in the plating. And that's where we turn the, what I do, the lacquers, into metal parts. They're turned into metal parts and stampers that get sent to the pressing plants, and that's what stamps out the record. So it's a very difficult, tedious black art that, you know, that's it's very difficult and very easy to make mistakes. So it's really exciting that there's more places coming online to do yeah. that. So that just tells me I've heard that there's a new plant going into uh, Canada in Toronto that's going to have 50 more presses. Wow. So... They're making new ones. Jack White actually came through here a couple of weeks ago. He's building a pressing plant in Detroit. I mean, it's been in the oh, news, cool. so it's not a secret. He's buying, I believe, eight brand new presses. So there's a company in Germany making brand new presses again. So I don't think these people would be doing all that if they thought this was a fad or just a little niche that's popped its head up. You know, they're, they're making players again. And it's just really exciting that who would have ever thought Mm-hmm. you know, that this would be where it went back to, but it seems to be here to stay. Very cool. What are some of the typical objections that you hear from artists' fears about getting into vinyl? Can we address some of those right now? Well, the first thing, you know, there's all kinds of things that I hear when the test pressings come back, because as you know, once I cut the record, I can't play it back in, in my cutting room and listen to it. It'll run it. So, I look at it through the microscope, make sure that I don't see any flaws. I, if there's places that I think are trouble spots, I will test cut it on a scrap and play it back and make sure that we're okay and make adjustments if I need to. But once you cut it, you're you know you're kind of flying blind, and you send it off, and they make the plates and they do the test presses, and it may be a month and two months sometimes before you get it back. You drop that needle and see if you made it or not. You know, <laughs> so anything can happen, and there's a number. You know, there's all kinds of things that can happen from the time it leaves my hands if it's not plated quickly, the groove walls can collapse. The plater can, there's all kinds of things that they can do that cause defects in the stampers. And there's just a number of things. And then when they press them, there's a thing called non-fill where the plastic doesn't get into all the nooks and crannies. And so that causes distortion. So the bad thing about it is, is that sometimes it gets a little ugly where everybody's blaming everybody. And I think I heard Cameron say this first, is that everybody points left and 
we're the ones <laughs> right. at the bottom, you know, I guess who's at the end of the chain, it's the, right. it's the cutter. And a lot of times it's not our fault. But the first thing I say when somebody calls me and they have a problem, I ask them, are you listening to it on a Crowsley record player? I hate those things. <sighs> they're, t- they're cool in the sense that it's turned a lot of people onto vinyl and it's something that they can play their stuff on. But people spend $100 on a player that has a speaker underneath it and it causes the needle to jump if there's a lot of bass in it, right. you know, and... They call you thinking that there's something wrong when there's really nothing wrong. So I usually ask them to try to play it. You don't have to play it on a multi-million dollar system. You want it to be able to play on an everyman system. But How, how about those, uh, I remember the Techniques 1200 or something. That was like yeah, those the are go-to great. Those uh, are great. turntable for DJs, right? Yeah, and well, DJ turntables are, that can be another problem because they're more rugged and built to, you know, scratch and play backwards. They're not as flexible, I guess would be the word. Or, I don't know if that's a good word to describe it, but... They're very durable machines, you know, so those, and they're they're usually weighted pretty heavy as well. So you can actually tear up your record playing it on one of those. Right, right. That's, that's happened too, you know, where DJs, it, you know, if they play it once and it's gone through a, a cheap player or something or even a DJ turntable, it can destroy the grooves or make it distort. So you got, that's why they usually send four or five pressings. And the best thing to do is play it on, four, you know, two or three systems. You know, basically all you need is something that will lock strobe in time so it's actually playing at the right speed. I have some people call and say, it's playing back too fast or too slow. And when I cut it, it locks and it has to be that speed. There's yeah, really sure. hardly any way unless it's a complete wrong speed. That has happened once. Or it was like complete, it lo- the strobe locked, but it was on the wrong speed. But, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be the right, won't work. Either it's not working or it's the right speed. So there's all, the, there's all that plethora of stuff that, can, that people can complain about. And usually you just have to, you know, calm down. Everything's cool. And if it is something wrong with it, we do, we do it again. Nice. So um, general rules of thumb for getting something ready for vinyl. Uh, you talked about making sure that your S's are tamed and, and under control. What about bass and low end? You want to make that centered as much as possible. That's really hard to cut, you know, stuff that the bass is panned to the left or right or the drums. You want your low end information to be centered because it's it causes a larger excursion for the styli to try to cut that and can cause it to actually skip out of the groove and stuff, too, if it's not done right. Now, what so, about the Beatles? They were putting the drums on. I know, it? man. Those guys, you know, Ray LaMontagne's record, first first record, too, the, the drums and bass are all panned off to the side, so yeah. to opposite sides. But I've heard his vinyl of that, and they, they did center the, yeah, the low-end information. There's a thing yeah. called the elliptical EQ, where you basically pick a frequency and everything below that can center it, it basically monos that, so yeah. that helps. It doesn't have to be, it can still almost appear to be coming out of one side or the other, but the, the low low frequency stuff needs to be centered as much as possible. I have something called the Brainworks uh, BX2 EQ. I think yeah. that's I'm calling it right by the right name, and it's got a mono maker knob where you can, yeah. everything below a certain frequency can be centered. Those are great. Those are great. Another thing to think of is phase. I'm thinking there's a lot of plugins out there that are either like stereo widening things or something to that effect, but to me, a lot of times when it's a band with like huge guitars that are panned hard. I hit the mono button and they disappear. This is, I mean, so they're out of phase with each other. It's that's got to be some plug in. A lot of times the reverbs will disappear when I just hit the hmm. mono button. Interesting. So I think those are due to the design of the plugins and things like that. So check your mixes in mono to make sure things don't disappear. You might need to pull them in a little bit, or you know, I love hard panning. That's the way I love to mix too. But just be careful and check your phase and check it in mono and make sure things don't just disappear. When things are out of phase, the groove starts to look like an hourglass kind of. It can get really narrow and the needle again can pop out of the groove when it's trying to track it looks like an hourglass nice yeah it's like fat and then it gets like, thin and like, fat again what is it like days of our lives yes like sands through time it's like sands through the hourglass <laughs> all right so how about giving us some advice great advice for running a recording session really smoothly number one be ready you know i'm always extremely prepared i still use an assistant on every session I do, pretty much every session I do. I think that's something that's starting to go by the wayside because of budgets and things people can't Mm -hmm. afford. They either expect these young engineers to work for free or they just don't use an assistant. And I think that's terrible because it's the only way they can learn to be, you know, or it's invaluable experience for them to even just be in the room with an experienced engineer. Even if it's something they learn like, I think that sounds terrible and I'll never do that. That's still valuable experience. So I just think the time that it saves and then the way that the whole session will run with an assistant is far superior to just 
trying to save the extra, you know, 150 yeah. bucks a day or whatever to do it yourself. Yeah, I understand sure. that that's necessary sometimes. And in home studios too, you don't always need an assistant maybe when you're, you know, it just depends on the scope. But if you have a full tracking session, I think that it's very stuff. necessary. I'm people. always set up the night before, or the morning before the client walks in to the point where, you know, all at least all the mics have been line checked and you're sure that they work. There's still going to be stuff that doesn't work. You'll know that it's not that yeah. problem. Yeah. And, you know, you can quickly, the musicians come in, set up, have a cup of coffee, scoot their instruments under the mics. I'll focus the mics, get sounds quickly and, and we're going, you yeah. know? So that's one piece of advice to make the session run smoothly is just be ready and don't be plugging in mics and trying them for the first time when the, when their guys are showing up, gals are showing up. It's just not professional. You know, and I, so I was raised in the big studio where at Arden, you know, where of course we had to have everything, everything ready to go and headphones checked, all that stuff. Again, there's still going to be things that don't work, but those first days of tracking sessions, you know, those can be really trying. If this breaks and that breaks, you're not sure if it was that wire, what mic cable was it? You get all those problems out of the way before they get there. Mm -hmm. And it just makes the musicians feel much more at ease. And they're, they're in there recording and they're working before they know what hit them. You know, people do have anxiety over, oh my God, the red light's on they're, they're We're recording now. I saw, I never say that over the talk back. I never get on there and say, we're rolling. I never do that. What do you say? I usually talk to the drummer and say, or whoever's leading the band and say, just give me a look and I'll give them a thumbs up in the window or just nod my head. Just right, don't make a big like, deal out of it. Here we go. Then it's like the drummer who's who's a member of the band is the one counting off the song. Yeah, and, it's usually and everybody's the used to that, right? Yeah. So yeah, he can look over and I'll nod my head. And you know, sometimes they're like, are you ready in there? You know, they might do that, but I know what it's like to be out here on the floor and hearing that voice like, we're rolling, you know, just comes <laughs> bashing it over. And, and all of a sudden everybody just tightens up and like, oh shit, we're recording, you know? It is really funny how, as producers, engineers, as the one with the talkback button, we often don't realize just the extent of the power that we have over what's about to happen just by pushing that button and saying something in the talkback. Right. It can really mess people up. And, and, and auto talkback is an evil thing, too, when the button sticks and you don't know it's on. That's oh, really, yeah, That could be right. a really bad oh, thing. <laughs> well, I learned long ago from a producer um, that the rule of thumb is just simply don't ever say anything while you're in the studio, that you wouldn't want somebody else to hear you say. Yeah, because the recorder can always be you on. Will, if you think you can talk about somebody else or something else in a way that you wouldn't want them to hear, you are going to find yourself in a room with a live microphone before you know it. And so well, now everybody's got their phones on, too. Everybody's filming all the time. So I don't, I don't really like that either. You know, I used to say, if you want to do all that, that's cool, but not while we're in record, you know, please. And not while we're in the control room talking about stuff. It just makes people's behavior change. Yeah. Even if somebody's walking around with a with a filming them while they're playing, they're gonna play different because they know they're being filmed. They're gonna try to look cool or they may be shy or embarrassed. And it just it's not cool. I think it goes down to quantum <laughs> physics, right? It's sort of at a quantum level they discovered that you can't observe something without changing it anyway. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. It just extends all the way up to music. Well, so now let's get into some uh, some stories. I know you work with some of the greats in the studio, one of whom is Tom Dowd. Can you tell us the story about getting that gig with Tom Dowd? There's a lot. You know, Tom really changed things up for me. I was really lucky. I started off working. He was the producer, and John Hampton was the engineer, and I was the assistant on a Leonard Skinner record. It was on a record called 1991. So it was really the first studio record since the plane crash. And it was fascinating, you know, just being around him and watching the way those guys, just the respect and, and, you know, they called him Father Dowd, just the, he was like a dad to him and kind of to everybody in the session and just full of knowledge and not only recording knowledge, but musical knowledge too. And he really had a hand guiding every single thing that happened, whether he said anything or not. He always liked to be on the floor, always had to have a headphone box and he would be out there waving his arms like a conductor most most of the time when bands were tracking. But one of the stories I tell that was fortunate for me was there was an instance where right after uh, Leonard Skinner, the Almond Brothers came in for the record Shades of Two Worlds. And there was an afternoon where there was a we were winding it down or it was time to, to do vocals and we had almost everything else recorded. And it was a song that Dickie Betts wanted to produce the vocal on Greg because it was a song that he wrote and there's a certain way he wanted him to sing it. Well, Greg didn't show up when he was supposed to and, you know, they had to go looking for him and they, they found him down on Beale Street sitting in with some band or something and he comes in a couple hours late and 
I'll try to paraphrase it, but Dickie wasn't happy about it at all. And when he walked in the room, they started shouting and yelling, and Dowd just got up and left the room, told him to take it outside. And There was a guy who was engineering Greg's vocals and his organ tracks. It was just a close friend, and Greg was more felt more comfortable with him, so like the engineers would switch when it was time to do Greg's thing. Dickie and Greg are yelling at each other in the hallway, and it looks like it's going to blow up, and the engineer got between them, and it's like, why do you guys got to fight, man? Come on, man. You love each other. Your brother. And Dickie just pulled one out of the back pocket and just drilled him. Wow. Knocked him into the Coke machines, and I grabbed Greg. Another guy grabbed Dickie, and they were swinging in the air. They never hit each other, but poor engineer broke, broke his glasses, probably broke his nose. There's blood everywhere, and he jumped up and, you know, quit. And I <laughs> finally, grabbed, finally, there's actually a threshold which you can cross in the recording studio. Yeah, right? yeah, that might be it. Getting yeah, punched in getting the nose. popped in the face with Dickie Betts's turquoise rings, man. You know, I thought you pretty. were going to say he got up and he was like, "No, no, it's okay, man, guys. Let's just go back to work." <laughs> yeah, <know? laughs> nope. So I we separate him and I pull Greg back into the studio and somebody took Dickie into another room and you know I remember Greg saying, "You brother man, you just witnessed the third breakup of the Almond Brothers band." <laughs> A half hour or so passes, and Dickie wants to talk to Greg now in the other room. And I'm like, are you cool? He's like, yeah, I'm cool. So we kind of threw him in there and stood outside to see if they were going to kill each other. And there was some yelling and screaming. But let's just say they came out 45 minutes later or so in a much better mood, pretty much with their arms around each other, you know, saying, ah, you know, we can do that sometimes, whatever. And so Greg looks around. And he goes, well, where's Tom? I said, Tom, <laughs> Tom went home. He goes, well, where's the engineer? And he said, He's probably at the hospital getting his nose set. He's like, man, I just feel like singing. He's like, you know how to work all this shit, brother man? <laughs> and I go, yeah, I do. So, he, so I recorded a couple, you know, several lead vocals that night, and uh, Greg was comfortable, and we knocked him out, and uh, Tom came in the next day and was just thrilled to death that we'd gotten all that done when he thought the whole evening was a bust. And so the next record that Tom Dowd brought to Arden, he put me in the engineer seat, um, which was Primal Scream. That's great, man. The one guy's busted nose was my big break. <laughs> my go, big yeah. break was his Literally, nose, I yeah, guess you could exactly. say. My big break was his nose. <laughs> that is going to end up on a click to tweet on the website later. <laughs> right there. It's perfect. All right, wonderful. So now I'm going to continue to name drop just for a moment because I know you've worked with Glenn Johns, for example. Can you tell us any great stories from that experience? Yeah, that was great too. All of them were great, but Glenn showed me, every, I think everybody knows his three mic drum technique. We, we all think we know his three drums. Well, there's a trick to it. Technique. And, you know, what he told me, he's like, everybody kind of knows where you put those mics, one overhead, one to the side, and the kick drum mic, and you put a snare mic on there if you want. But the trick to it that he told me was that you put, as he called them, screens or baffles in between the drums. And he said, I don't know why, but I always put the bass on the left and the however many guitars on the right. But he told me the trick was making sure that the face of the cabinets were parallel with the outside face of the kick drum. And, uh, you know, and you do have screens, but he said, and if you can control the volume a little bit, you know, they can't be blaring. If you, if you can get the musicians to turn it down to a respectable thing and the bleed that you have will be really great and you isolate the singer and there you go. And so that's what we did. And it was fantastic. Wow. And so I've had that work really well. And I've also had it not work before too. Yeah. It, it is volume dependent. You know, Gotta if they play the parts right. Yeah. But the, the phasing is no issue at all. The bleed is minimal and it's cool bleed. It's a great thing that he showed me. I've used it over and over, and I still do things differently all the time, too, but usually that's where I start as far as micing drums. I'm a minimalist now. I don't mic the toms. That's you know why he just wants me to. I'm going to ask you again. I think, we, I think we owe it to our listeners, to the rock stars, to hear it broken down a little more. Can you kind of break down what that miking is for that three miking and, and Yeah, you, and you basically, it? he would say that they would always use a matched pair. Back when he was doing it with the Stones and the Who and... Led Zeppelin and all that. Usually, he said they used a pair of uh, Telefunken 251s or 67s. And so you put one overhead. I think of it as, I look at the drum kit as clusters, kind of. So I look at the cluster where typically, if it's a right-handed drummer, there'd be a hi-hat, a snare, usually a crash cymbal there, and maybe a rack tom. Mm -hmm. I look at that as one cluster. So I put the overhead mic kind of looking at that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you know? coming over the drummer's head or something. Yeah, like and I've got kind of long arms. I usually take a, a mic cable or something to just stretch my arm out, and that's usually where, it, again, it depends on how loud the drummer is, but I, I hold it in the middle of my chest to my arm, 
And that's usually the distance I start at. And the same the same distance, I take it and go to my side, and that's where I put the side mic. It's on the oh. side of the floor, Tom. And you imagine that looking across the kit. And I notice you're sort of, in one hand, you're holding the end of the cable, and in the other one, you're holding it to the center of your chest, not mm-hmm. down on the snare drum. Right. So it's sort I've of I've seen like, it done both ways. But it's sort of equidistant to the, you know, the body of the drummer. Yeah, that's the way I do it. And I don't really know why, but I've just... It makes Cause sense. Because it's, it's cool. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> but you, I kind of imagine this point where those two capsules would meet in the center, and it would kind of meet, you know, a little bit somewhere around near the snare drum. Mm-hmm. And you pan those left and right. You may not pan the overhead off hard left and right. You can. You would think it would make your snare drum go all the way to the left, but it really doesn't. But I usually take that one and pan it in just a little bit, just to ear. Mm-hmm. Then the kick drum mic is, I never put it inside the kick drum anymore, mm-hmm. very rarely. So would you have a kick drum that maybe the front head has a hole in it or it's a complete, a full Preferably head? not. No you know? hole. All right. Yeah. And uh, if you got no hole, is there anything inside the drum? That's important. You just got to see. Yeah, you would probably want something inside to muffle so usually. Bit, yeah. It's usually too hollow or ringy sounding. But again, it depends on the song and the drummer. Well, I love having an option of several different kick drums. Maybe you want one with a hole in it. Maybe, you know, one that's that's not, you know. When I was talking to Jody... He was talking about having a pillow in his kick drum that has been in there since 1970. Yeah. I know that pillow. So, I've recorded Jody. Yeah. Jody plays loud, too. He might be the loudest drummer I've ever recorded. He's, wow, that's far off. I, he's I don't thunders. know that I would have guessed that listening to the records, you know? Yeah, he plays really loud. Another joke we used to say about Jody, I made the last Big Star record with him, and Ken and John from the Posies, you know, that were in Big Star, we, they would always joke, like, after a take, Jody wears drum gloves when he plays. When you'd hear the Velcro come off after take, and you're like, that's, that's the take. Right. That's the one. That's great, man. <laughs> like a soccer goalie, right? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, back to the Glenn Johns thing, that's pretty much it. I have it in my head where I see this kind of, uh, It's a, I guess it would be an isosceles triangle. It's not equilateral necessarily, but from the overhead to the side mic to the kick drum is this kind of angled triangle. Mm -hmm. You'll never have phase. And I start there. I put a snare mic on a lot of times. Just It's usually pretty important just to have that if you need it or someone wanted to trigger something later. I don't usually do that either, but it's it's decent to have. And then if you want to fill in more, if you have something really light and you think you need more ride cymbal or something like that, you can throw, you can just add them in as you go. Just make sure your your distance between your mics is good and you won't ever have phase problems. Because phase is, even you have a million mics on the drums, that's your killer. It's the yeah. phase problems that can't, yeah. it just sounds tiny. Well, you end up just with a, basically just a bunch of close mics. Yeah. You know, it's all you end up really being able to use. Yeah. And I don't, I love, and I usually love to, I have an old cassette deck, an old Sony cassette deck with one of those built in compressors in it. Mom and dad gave me that in 1981 when I graduated high school to record my college lectures if I went to class. <laughs> but uh, they're great, man. You just put them, you don't even have to have a cassette in them. You just, hit that tab in there to make it think there's a cassette and go in and record and just set it on the floor somewhere in front of the kit. Use a mini, little mini jack out through a DI box or exactly, something Exactly, like exactly. And man, you know, on its own, it sounds pretty awful, but uh, mixed in with drums, it sounds fantastic. It just, and if you ever need more cymbal decay, too many cymbals will destroy it. It just turns into, right, you know. Right. But uh, if you can get your drummer to control his, his cymbaling, I take them away from them sometimes, <laughs> you know, make them overdub it if they need it. But it sounds great. Yeah, I love that. I sort of learned that trick when I was working with Brad Jones at Alex the Great, mm-hmm. where I started. And we used to have a micro cassette recorder and we'd do something like that. And we called it the Crapsta. Yeah. It was the, the Crapsta. Crapsta mic. And it I does. It. It puts it, you can do that with acoustics too. You could, you know, a nice mic on an acoustic, put one of those right next to it, blend that into taste. And it's yeah. a great, great thing. Yeah, they're great. How about a story of working with Jim Dickinson? Jim was Jim was great. Um, you know, I always kind of credit him with kind of turning the light on for me when I was a student. He came and talked to our class one day. And to be honest, you know, when I started off in school and I didn't have any studio experience, you know, my stuff didn't sound as good as most of the other people in my class. I just I wasn't a natural. It was very discouraging, and I really had to work at it and. You know, I had the desire to do it and the the hard work to do it, but I was I was basically I was trying too hard in hindsight. Jim came and spoke to our class one day and what he said was, When you're an engineer, recording engineer, what you're doing is you're capturing air with your microphones, you're turning it into electricity. While it's electricity, you can manipulate it, and then you're turning it back into air again. Simple, huh? It sounds 
kind of overly simplified, but that's what did it for me. That's when I went, oh, that's what we're doing. Okay. I just thought I had to turn all the knobs to make it sound good, but that's not the case. What you're doing is you're capturing air, you're manipulating it however you want to or, or not, and you're turning it back into air that comes out the speakers again. That's yeah. all we're doing. Manipulating electrons. Yeah. And you're storing it to a magnetic medium. That's you, what we're you mean doing. my hard drive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was one, you know, the, the best tech way from Jim is always is so entertaining to be around. And there's always great stories, great storyteller. And another story I tell about Jim is that one day I wasn't working on this project with him, but I was in the hallway at Arden out by the Coke machines or whatever. Hey, Jim, how you doing, man? And he was like, I'm doing great. I'm achieving the highest form of the art of production right now. And so I didn't know what he was talking about. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, do you hear that music coming out of that room down the hall at Studio A? I go, yeah. He goes, I'm standing out here talking to you. Yeah. And he goes, I'm producing that. (laughs) Producing an absentia is the highest form of the art. Those guys are in there trying as hard as they can because they know I'm going to come back in there. And I'm out here talking to you, but I'm producing in there. And I was like, okay, you know, that's that's cool great. stuff like that. You know, and then did you say, well, so am I helping you produce? Yeah, am do I, I get a credit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> split your royalties. Well, so now what about, you know, with all your own experience and then some of these folks that you've worked with, what are some examples of uh, what you've seen, the, the way to bring out the best performance out of the studio? Making them comfortable. The music? Just making them comfortable. You know, Dowd was really big on, Tom Dowd was really big on the fact of don't leave the poor singer out there by him, by his or herself. He would always make them, when it was vocal overdub time, he would always make them feel special. Instead of getting on the talk back and barking your flat or do that again, he would tell me to cut the monitors and he would get up out of his chair and he'd go out there and talk to him. He'd come back in. So it, I think that that went a long way of making the singer feel like, He's not in there telling me I'm singing flat in front of everybody in the room. Him and I have this connection. He's out here giving me a secret or giving me a pat on the back or like, you almost got it, but phrase it this way. Turn that around or think about this. When you're hitting that note, you're not getting there. Shoot over them. All these little things that you can coach a singer to do, he would do it in private. Mm-hmm. Um, and another good thing I think for young engineers to know is like, try this sometime. If you're not used to being on the other side of the glass, go stand in front of the mic and just for a minute, I used to do this with my students sometimes, just for for a minute. Don't talk, stand there and see how long a minute feels like when you see people in the control room talking and you don't know what they're saying. They're not on the talk back. You don't know if they're laughing at you or making fun of you. You're like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Or they're arguing over a word or whatever. You just don't know. It seems like an eternity, just a minute. Imagine if it's two or three minutes, you lose them. You're going to lose the singer. You want to keep them excited to sing again. I think another thing that is missing these days is rewind time. Yeah. It's just space bar, space bar, space bar. Again, again, again. You just wear them out, man. It's just, I don't like that. You know, even if I am using Pro Tools, I try not to just, you know, space bar, space bar, space bar. Yeah, you are saving time, but there needs to be a breath or a thought, but don't. Part of that is what you just said is the saving time aspect. Sometimes it's as the engineer, the the studio owner, whatever, feeling like you're trying to deliver that everything in one day that the band requested of you, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's certainly a trade-off, you know? I hate... I hate feel. I hate clocks in the studio and everybody staring at their phones all the time, and I don't want worry to ever set in on my session. I try to keep that worrying about time out of it. You know, I've heard it said a long... It's not my words, but I've heard it said a long time ago. The In the studio, the work will expand or contract to the amount of time that you have to do, and that's an absolute truth. If you got a day to do this, it's going to take you a day. It has to. you got to be done. So that you make decisions all day long based on that. When we had two and a half months to make a record... It took two and a half months, and we spent every penny of that budget, you know? We're making them for, you know, a tenth of what we used to. Some of that's good. There's not a lot of jacking around. I have this thing that I do where I offer a band to come in, and it's all done in a day. So you come in, and with two songs, you got, you have to be ready to go and be rehearsed and everything. But you can come in the studio. We'll set up. We're going to record overdub and mix two songs, and then I'm going to cut it on the lacquers on my lathe that night, all in a day for an affordable price. And I mean, it's not super cheap, but it's an amount you can put on your credit card. And through all these years, it's it's always amazed me how when you 
are tracking a song and you get everybody to come in and you listen to playback, how great it sounds. Everybody is extremely excited about it. Then you either go to the next song or you do whatever, and the, the position of those faders is never there again, and you yeah. never get that back. I mean, you might get something better, quote unquote, but so when I'm doing these one day things, what I try to tell the band the way I like to run it, if they're cool with it, we're going to get one song, we're going to overdub if you want to redo your vocal, whatever, we're going to do whatever overdubs you need to do right then and there, and that's pretty much going to be the mix. I'm going to write it manually, and we'll print a mix of it, and then we go to the next song. We're capturing that that feeling of what what was going on when we listened to playback and everybody was jazzed about it. Now, of course, there's going to be some things down the road where, you know, if, if you're a perfectionist or you have to have control over every little sound, that's not going to be the, you're not going to want to do that with me. But if you're willing to let go and and accept it, most of the time it just sounds incredible because you let go of that and you got to trust the guy doing it. And that's, it is what it is. And then you cut your master that night before you have time to overthink it and ruin yeah. it. You got two sides of a 45 right yeah. there, Yeah, right? and then you, you know, you got to go master it digitally if you want to release it that way too. But, you know, you're done with it. And it's, people love it. And they, the people that have done that, they usually are really, really happy with it. And it's, it's a different thing. You know, and I've, this hasn't really come to fruition yet, but I also tell people if you want to do that five times in a year, you got an album now. You can release it serially or put it all together as an album now, you know? Nice. Well, all right, Jeff, well, we're going to take a break here for a sec and we'll come right back in with the jam session. But rock stars, before we do that, I just want to remind you that you'll find all the links to the things we're talking about and a link here to Sam Phillips recording service and Jeff Powell and, and the, uh, the cutting room in the show notes at rsrockstars.com. And then if you just search Jeff Powell, you'll go straight to the blog post. And as well, you'll find it on your iTunes podcast app. You can just click right through there. And we'll see you in just one sec for the jam session. Hey, everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitar is recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to MixMasterBundle.com Enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, it's Lid Shaw, and we're back now with our guest, Jeff Powell. You're listening to Recording Studio Rock Stars, and we're very excited to be here at Sam Phillips Recording Services in Memphis, Tennessee, as part of my Memphis series. Jeff, are you ready to jam? Yes. Awesome. Well, so when you started out in recording, what was one of the things that was holding you back as you got rolling with this? I got to say nothing. I never was. Nothing held me back. I was so determined that I, wasn't, I wouldn't let nothing hold me back. So wait, so nothing was holding you back or nothing actually held you back? <laughs> I was Nothing was going to hold me back. <laughs> All right, cool. Groovy. Well, I like that. Just So what does that translate into advice? Is it sort of like, don't let anything stop you from doing what you want to do? Yeah. I tell young engineers when I speak to them a lot of times at these conferences and things, like, you should probably only go into this business if nobody can talk you out of it. Yeah, exactly. Good advice. I don't think anybody could talk me out of it. Me neither. When I started doing this, nobody even knew what I was talking about. Me too. Me too. All right. So now share with us some of the best advice that you received. Gosh, um... You know, there's so much being, I was so fortunate to work with so many great 
producers and engineers. One was don't get married, but I ignored that. I'm very, I've been happily married for 23 years. I met my wife in the studio. Congratulations. Actually, but she's a musician as well. So, you know, you do have to have a really special person that understands all the sacrifices they're going to have to make. Number one, like not hardly seeing you a lot of times or leaving town, but it all works out in the end, you know. Again, I'm really lucky to have Susan, but you really do need someone special that's going to understand how, what the hours that it entails and and the sacrifices that you have to make and that they have to make for you as well. How have the hours and the sacrifices changed for you throughout your career? I just don't, I'm not going to do 14 hour days anymore unless I have to. I like to keep it to 10, 10 working. So I'm usually here 11, you know. Yeah, it just, I've learned that the law of diminishing returns, I used to think we have to get all this done tonight. There's just a point where you're going to have to redo it anyway. Just be productive while you're there, as productive as you can be. And just the sheer amount of hours isn't going to make a difference. Is there a typical routine that a day might take for you when you're in the studio working? In the studio or in vinyl world? I guess the studio. You know, I don't start as early anymore either. You know, I, I would say depending on what the musicians want to do or, or what time schedule they're on. Usually start at 11 in the morning and try to be done by 10 at night. Mm-hmm. And do you, would you typically take a food break at the same time I don't like to usually day? leave the studio. I usually like to order in and take a little break, you know, but um, that depends where you're working too. If you're out of town, sometimes producers, if you're the engineer, you do what the producer wants to do. You know, if I'm calling the shots, I usually like try to let's order in or take a little break and hang. But dinner time is an important hang time. You know, it, there's a lot of bonding that goes on there. And, you know, the pressure's off for a few minutes and we can tell jokes and laugh and lighten up a little bit. Um, do you always try and stay in sync with everybody else as far as the musicians? Would you only eat when the musicians eat? Or have you found that you work better if you feed yourself when you need to, and if it happens to sync up with everybody else, that's what you do? Yeah, it just depends on the group. Sometimes if they're local, you know, they'll come in, they've already eaten, or that's when it's a little weird if they're local musicians. But if they're all from out of town, then we'll tend to all, let's take a break and go eat. It's on the surface, this sounds like such a mundane no, it's important. Question, man. but it, you, we know how critical it is. Yeah, I mean, like you crash and burn if you don't. Yeah, and and you know, again, the, I think that's another thing where the assistance are important to me because just by nature, I'll work on something and I'll like uh, just a minute. I got one more thing to do, and then we'll take a break. And an hour can go by, and they're like, "Dude, stop! You need to stop and eat." You know, because I'll just keep. Go- I'll forget. Then you've gone too long. Now your stomach hurts, and you, yeah. you know you don't need to do that. I've tried to cut out that nonsense. Yeah, I still do it, but. I try not to. I actually try to uh, impress upon the new interns the importance of our lunch break in the middle of the day. And, you know, the, I ask them, first I ask them to just understand how important it is to everybody that they're actually able to eat. You know, that that's an opportunity for them to just kind of act like a fancy waiter or waitress at that point where they come in and make sure, you know, just deliver everybody's food to them, set them up, give them a napkin, give them a cup of water, give them the- That is so important. I've seen so many meltdown, like not being able to get the food thing right or getting upset. Like you can see, they're just pissed. Like everybody gives them a credit card or here's a 20 and keeping the change straight where they just completely got flustered and botched the whole thing. And and everybody knows like, wow, what's his problem, man? He seemed all pissed off or, you know, check the orders before you bring them back because- he didn't check it and yeah. they got mayonnaise sure on their no sandwich. They asked for no mayonnaise. You know, <laughs> it's it's one of those things. And, and so the music, musicians get pissed if they... Well, because they're time. working their ass off all yeah. day long. And that yeah. one little food break is all they get, you yep. know? It's and important. Uh, one of the things we do is we have this special, you know, accordion folder for the lunch runs. And yeah, so the each, menu book. Each, yeah, each menu goes in there or each receipt and, you know, people's different money goes in different pockets so the change is organized and stuff like that. That's Simple very things. important. But it keeps everybody happy and if everybody's happy, they're making good music. And if exactly. they're making good music, you look like you got a good studio. Yep. All right, so now share with us a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce. I mean, that was probably one right there. <laughs> yeah, here's one that Hampton taught me. The old... They're running through a song on the floor, and you're in the control room, and now they're playing through the song, and they're over halfway through the song, and you're going, they think I'm recording. Nobody said anything, but they're going to... So first thing you do is, even if it's halfway through, go in to record, but go out on the floor and move a microphone, even if you don't need to. Go out there. So if if you think that they think that you're recording, and you're like, they're going to get done with this tank, go, did you get that? And you sit there, well, you didn't say you were, you know. Right. 
don't ever be that guy. Go out there and move the snare mic an inch. And if they think they're recording, they're going, what are you doing, man? Like snare mic went out. I had to wiggle the wire. And so like all of a sudden it just redirects the possible yeah, like, blame. Well, on that's something. feeling really good. Let's count it off and get it. You know, then you're yeah. cool. Nice. Nice. Um, speaking of feeling good, uh, I remember there was something I learned once that I felt like it was called the Nashville start where you, the band plays together and they get in the groove. Cause like the whole issue of counting off a song when you're tracking, it's amazing how quickly people can completely and utterly lose sight of what they just had going on. You know, I can do it if I'm playing an instrument. And so there was this idea of playing a few bars of the actual groove and then everybody stops and the drummer counts and then they go into it. Have you seen something like that work? You got any advice on making sure that the, that that take actually the beginning of the take is in the right moment? Yeah, it's, I've done that before too. It really, that depends on the band or if it's like a band or if it's a bunch of session musicians together for an artist or something, you know, that's a whole different dynamic. That kind of thing tends to happen. I think when it's session musicians. Yeah, right. I, I've certainly tried to explain that to people and killed the session, just trying to explain the idea. Right. Of people, you know? right. Yeah. So yeah, whatever it takes, you know, I usually work that out before. Again, I, I usually kind of have a thing with the drummer, you know, and just say, look, you know, when we take off, I'm not going to say we're rolling. If you want to turn around and look, however you want to do it, what makes you comfortable, look at me, I'll hold up my hand, whatever. Just count it off. And so we don't don't want everybody thinking, okay, this is the one or this isn't the one. So that's why they can take off without you if you're not, but I tell the drummer too, don't take off without me, you know? So we have to have this in the air, the way we look at each other or yeah. a hand signal or sign language or whatever. Yeah, the drummer's your, your man on the inside. Yeah, you, you, and then you kind of develop inside. this thing like, yeah, me and the drummer, we're cool. We got this, you know. Um, so how about a favorite hardware tool for the studio? Something that when you have it on sessions, maybe something unexpected, uh, you always are glad you've got it around. Probably like that cassette deck thing I was talking about. That's a good secret weapon. I like weird stuff, cheap mics that aren't supposed to necessarily sound good. I like different textures of things. So I don't get my I don't get upset if the the singer doesn't feel comfortable singing into my Sony 800G ten thousand dollar microphone. If he wants to sing in an SM7, that's cool with me. Is that the is that the Sony the one with like the Studebaker looking yeah, yeah. tail fin going off the back? Yeah. Actually, I got one sitting over there. <laughs> but I've seen some engineers get upset. They like, well, no, you want to sing in the forty-seven or forty-eight. This is the best sounding mic we have in the studio. You got to sing through this. And they may want to sit on the couch and hold it in their hand like Bono does, but the speakers out of phase. Yeah. Whatever it takes to make them comfortable, you know. Yeah, I think I remember reading that Beck would lay down on the couch with a fifty-seven in his hand, and that's how he'd get the the lyrics for um, Midnight Vultures or something like that. Yeah, so like whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Don't, I don't get too hung up over, I have to have this piece of gear on this thing every time or I can't work. You know, that came a lot from at Arden when we were all, all three rooms were going all the time. You know, Hampton and Hardy and myself maybe all have a session going. And we all had our things that we used, you know, that we wanted, but we never got in fights or arguments about it. We worked it out. And sometimes you're like, well... They're using that, so I got to figure something else out on this. So it led to experimentation by right because you guys are sharing the gear. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. You're like siblings that get along. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How about a uh, favorite software tool for the studio? There's a FabFilter deesser. FabFilter is a company that somebody I think Matt Rossbang actually just turned me on to it. Yeah. I have a great EQ uh, and a great deesser. Um, I just just got their EQ and actually I, I owe them a review of the EQ. I just am still getting it. comfortable with it. It's so multifaceted. Yeah, I love it. It it really it's not obtrusive. It you know it'll do what you need to do. You can still be subtle with it. Yeah, I remember seeing a, one of their videos where they talked about the. EQ curve at the top end, as it goes up to the Nyquist frequency, it actually retains its shape, unlike most other EQs, which do a quick nosedive right at the Nyquist frequency. So wow. something about that as a mastering tool is supposed to be magical. I don't know. I gotta, yeah, I, I didn't know that. More. I didn't now know you that. Did? All right. How about a resource for the business or advice for the business side of recording and having a studio and doing this for a living? If you haven't seen Tom Dowd in the language of music, you have to get that DVD and go see it. I used to require my students to to look at that. It's a great story. You know, I'm so tied into Tom personally, but it's just a great story about his life and how he got into recording and the great things he did with his life. And he was just an amazing guy and, and changed changed recording. I actually have custom 
built MCI console that used to be at Criteria. Oh, really? In Studio C. It's the the one that did Hotel California and the Bee Gees records, Staying Alive, Saturday Night Fever. And I suspect that Tom was probably pushing had those to faders have. around at some point. So. He had to I'm happy to share those faders with him. Okay, so now here's a sort of a hypothetical question, but imagine yourself starting out in a new town. You need a simple setup to record music. You need to find people to record, and you got to make ends meet. So this obviously could be directed at somebody who's, you know, a student who's just beginning in this. What advice would you have for them? You know, I'd probably hang out at the bars and see, try to get a feeling of what the scene was, you know, who, what bands are cool, what bands do you like? Along with the local rag, you know, whatever, picking it up and seeing who they're talking about all the time or what's going. You can look and see who's playing around. What are the cool clubs to go to? Probably start there and work back, you know. Then what are the cool studios in town? Who are the studio cats in town? If I was just starting off, make myself available. You know, so I would love to, can I intern here, you know? Can I start off? Do you have anything at all for me to do? If you have any paying work, that would be cool too. Just being willing to do anything to get your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. To the point where, you know, it's it's tough to go in there and go, can I come in and sit on your sessions? It just, you know? <laughs> can I come in there and talk on the talk back to the musicians yeah. while they were getting ready to do a take? Yeah, yeah. This fragile You ecosystem. realize that vocal's a little flat in the third verse, don't you? <laughs> oh, you know? There you go. There's some advice on what not to say. Yeah. Now, what about the simple recording setup? What are your feelings about what somebody might start with, begin with now. To well, I had one at my point. house for a while, and I made a couple of records in my house till I finally, it started growing, and I'm like, this has got to stop, or my house is going to turn into a studio. But I just had a simple Pro Tools rig with, you know, you can get like an Apogee Quartet or something like that, three or four, say four converters with Mike Pre's built in. When I was doing the simple, I bought two Brent Averill 1272s and two API 312s from Brent Averill. And... I had a couple, I had a 57, a 421, a couple of Earthworks mics, and my good Sony 800G mic. So, <laughs> And your your simple $10,000 Yeah, mic. my simple 10000 You know, I did some, one time I did a thing at my house on four-track cassette, and I had the Sony hooked up, and we figured, oh, yeah. going oh, through yeah. the Brent Averill into the Yamaha cassette four-track, and so like, we think we had like... I got like a $12,000 front end going into a $300 cassette machine. Yeah, and then at the end you're like, holy shit, that's the best sounding track <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've gotten yet. <laughs> exactly. All right, so now here's the big the big whopper of a question. What's the single most important thing that our listeners can do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? Being able to get into a session and work with an established engineer, preferably somebody that you admire that you think is getting good stuff, getting good sounds and stuff, but just being in the room any way you can, whether you're an assistant or whatever, and get used to hearing good sounds, then whether you do exactly what that guy's doing or not, it's not really important. Just getting your ear trained to hearing really cool stuff and putting your own thing to it. That's the whole trick. Yeah. Being around people too. So now what about for people who may not really have a local scene? You know, Have you found that there are some valuable online options? Not that you necessarily would list off the resources, but have you discovered that, do you feel like that's still a a viable way for people to start getting a sense of this? I um, do. I do. But coming up when I did, that wasn't even there. So I might not be the best person to ask about that, but you know, so, so much nowadays I just do, I just do. So if there's something I need to learn or go to, I, you can find anything on the internet, you know, pretty much. And some pretty good advice. And if you got musicians, wherever you are, Find yeah. them, record them. Doesn't yeah, matter. That's Just it. record them every day. That's it. You'll learn. You know, and you might have to do it cheap, but try to get paid something. You know, people will let you work for free as long as you let them yeah. let you work for free. If you, if you charge them nothing, they may not show up to the session that you are about to record. And if you charge them a little bit, they'll probably show up. Yeah. Yeah. Plus you're driving the price down for everybody. If you just not about being the cheapest, so you get the most work. Some people operate on that theory, but I think that's... I don't know. That's one way of looking at it. It's not the way I look at it. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much for being here on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, Jeff. Can you let our listeners know how they can find you, follow your work, learn more about you? Well, I'm kind of slow in that area. I mean, I uh, do have a Facebook account, so you could check out Jeff Powell and find me on Facebook, probably. I don't have a website for my vinyl work right now. I'm going to, I have a domain name, but I've been so busy. I haven't gotten one up. So it's just a nice. placeholder right now. If you were to look at name of my company's takeout vinyl, but you know, you could feel free to uh, email me with specific questions. My 
professional email is jeff at jeffpowell.net. Okay. Uh, P-O-W-E-L-L. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. And two F's in Jeff, too. <laughs> two F's in Jeff, not G-E-O either. J-E-F-F. Right, right. J-E-F-F. All right, Groovy. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. It's really been a, an honor to be here with you. Thank you. And look forward to seeing you around the studio. Okay, man. Thanks. All right, cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.